Good afternoon and happy Wednesday, everyone. It's so great to see such a wide variety of an audience on. Today, I am Michelle. I'm the Outreach Coordinator here at Pasadena Humane. If you're joining us for the very first time, um, if you're not, welcome back. I am joined today by the most amazing Lauren Hamlet, our wildlife manager. How are you today, Lauren? Hi, I'm great. Good to see you. Thanks for coming, everyone. Yeah. So I know that we're going to talk about one of your most amazing, one of your most favorite subjects today, the coyotes. Oh, yeah. So, and uh, living in Arcadia for a very long time, I've had quite a, a few uh, run-ins with peafowl. Yep. So. And all over the foothill communities nowadays. <laughs> Yeah, they're not just uh, in Arcadia anymore. That's true. So, um, for those of you that are joining us for the very first time today, I'm going to go over some webinar reminders with you. Give me just one moment. All right. So, Reminder, this is an audiovisual presentation, so even though you can see and hear us, we cannot see nor hear you. Um, with that in mind, please use the question box on the right-hand side of your screen to ask any questions. Um, we will get to them at the end of the presentation. Lauren may have some information that answers your question throughout our time together today. Okay. Um, as I had mentioned before, we are talking about coexisting with coyotes and peafowl. Uh, next month, we're going to be talking about enrichment with your critters. So if you have guinea pigs or rabbits, um, please join us as we talk with our behaviorist, Quinn. Um, and then in October, we're going to be talking about pet emergency preparedness with car caramel mims from Pet Porter Pals. Um, this recording is being this webinar is being recorded so if at any time you've got to leave the room or you miss it or you want to just go back and watch it it's going to be sent to you tomorrow afternoon and if you enjoy this webinar as much as we enjoy giving it to you you can go ahead and click on this link to make an impact with a donation to our shelter animals and i'll go ahead and put that link in the chat box as well so you have uh, easier access to it. And without further ado, take it away, Lauren. Okay. Can you see my screen? Yes, we can. Mode? Okay, here we go. Thanks so much, first of all, everybody for coming. Um, this is oh sorry i haven't done a webinar in a while so bear with me <laughs> um okay so this is coexisting with coyote and peafowl as michelle already said um and i'm lauren hamlet i am the wildlife coordinator here at pasadena humane um and or wildlife manager sorry <laughs> and um we uh we here uh PHS, you know, we have a wildlife department that takes in thousands of injured, sick, and orphan animals every year. Um, we, we most of the time are stabilizing the animals and then um, transferring them out to specialty wildlife rehab facilities. So we partner with a lot of different organizations like um, the Raptor Center up in Ojai. We send a lot of our hawks and um, birds of prey up there. Um, as well as like International Bird Rescue out in San Pedro. We um, send all our waterfowl there. Um, but we do raise um, a lot of um, like opossums and squirrels and other things for their full, um, their full rehabilitation at Pasadena Humane. So um, we, we see a lot of animals every day. Um, and we also have our wildlife helpline number, which I hope you guys are familiar with. If not, go ahead and take out your phone right now and put this number in your phone. Um, and that's on your screen at the bottom there. It's 
1129 and um, our staff is monitoring that phone from 9 a.m. to 5 p.m. Um, those are our intake hours. So if you have an animal that you're concerned about, or even if you just have questions about, you know, what's normal wildlife behavior, or if you, you know, have a skunk under your house and you don't know how to get it out, you can text that number or call that number. We do prefer that you text. You'll probably get a quicker response that way. Um, and if you could send a photo of the animal as well as a brief description and where you're located, that's going to help speed that process along as well. Um, so we um, we really really vamp vamped up the um, the wildlife helpline and um, and that's been a big part of our department this past um, year and a half ish. Um, so let's just don't jump into urban wildlife here. So today we're going to talk about mainly peafowl and coyotes, but um, I want you to think about what other wild animals you're seeing in your backyards usually. Um, urban wildlife is any wildlife that has adapted well to our urban environment. So that can even be some bears who have adapted really well. Um, also, obviously, that includes like pigeons and possums and the stuff that you normally think about when you think about urban wildlife, like raccoons and, um, you know, like rats and things like that. But also uh, urban wildlife is also hawks and owls and uh, mockingbirds and lots of different native, beautiful, beneficial um, species in our environments. Um, so our neighborhoods are their habitat. They're born and raised here. Uh, they're not, you know, coming down from the foothills. Um, they, they are, they are our neighbors. So um, it's important that we uh, look at them that way and um, figure out how we can relate to them in an effective and safe way, so that everyone is um, benefiting. So for peafowl, um, this is just a brief history of. Uh, peafowl introduction to um, Southern California. Um, they're not native to California and they're originally imported from India actually uh, back in the 40s. Um, so um, I believe, I don't know if this is legend or myth, but I believe it was either the Huntingtons or uh, Lucky Baldwin, who started bringing them in, and they made their home at the the Arboretum, um, and you know the the residential areas were formed, and the peafowl totally took advantage of all the delicious food resources that were around, and the fact that the humans weren't bothering them, so they became very comfortable um, and have adapted super well. Um, they are kind of like chickens in a lot of ways. They're they're part of the the ground fowl, land fowl um, family of birds. So that also inc includes like quail and pheasant, um, but chickens too. Uh, so you could just think of them as like really big fancy chickens, <laughs> um, and their diet consists mostly of insects um but they do you know as you guys probably know like to eat out of bird feeders um there's lots of plants that they like um that if you have them in your garden it might be more attractive to them um and then obviously their their biggest thing that are they're known for is those um colorful feathers that the males grow and display during the breeding season which is now um and Usually the males are with a, a harem of two to five females. Um, so that's usually how you're going to see them sort of arranged out there. Um, but that's not a hard and fast rule either. I, I know I've driven around and seen like five male peafowl and like one female. So um, so that's just kind of like a, a, a guideline for what you might see. Um, but yeah, let's move on. Even after, you know, we we see them and we think they're so beautiful and they're so cool. But, you know, once the novelty of peafowl kind of wears off, um, I understand that 
Uh, they can definitely be a nuisance. They are quite loud. They're um, quite messy. If you live in one of these areas where peafowl have gotten really comfortable, you know that they can tear up your gardens, ruin your lawns, dry, you know, poop all over the place. And trust me, I know it smells so bad. Um, and, you know, they can be on your rooftops and pecking at your cars and pecking at your windows of your cars but um hopefully we can we can figure out uh, or talk about you know some of the ways we can prevent this from happening um so first of all i just want to say that with the the pecking at the windows and the cars and things like that um generally it is believed that it's because they're seeing their reflection. So if it's a male and you have a fancy shiny car, maybe your car's not fancy, but it's you just like to keep it clean and shiny. Um, and you just got it waxed and detailed and you come back and then all of a sudden the pee fouls there and it just starts pecking at your car. Um, it's probably because it thinks that it sees another male in the reflection and, you know, they're not the brightest birds in the world. Um, so, so they don't realize that it's not actually another bird. And, and so they're basically just trying to attack, um, what the reflection that they're seeing. So one way to, to sort of deter that behavior is going to be getting, um, either parking your car in a garage um, that would probably be the easiest or um, getting a cover for your car or be like me and just don't wash your car. <laughs> and I've never had a problem with peacocks because my car does not reflect their, um, <laughs> their, uh, their reflection. Um, but yeah, so it's just kind of understanding their behavior um, to try and prevent these sort of things from happening happening and, and that's also going to be the case with windows on your house you know if you um, keep your blinds down if peafowl are around um, that'll help or you can get these cool stickers that are reflective um, so it also helps prevent birds from flying into your windows um, but it also helps prevent um, peafowl from thinking that there is another peacock inside your house that it wants to fight um, and uh, and then also uh, we, we definitely want to talk about compost. We think compost is great, right? So um, I would do definitely want to encourage everybody to participate in some composting programs. But um, if you do have an open compost in your yard, just know that that is going to attract lots of different wildlife and you might have some um, neighbors who are not happy with that. So um investing in a closed compost system or um signing up for things like um i believe it's called soil share um or la compost um uh co-ops um there's lots of different really cool options for composting um that aren't necessarily going to be right on um in your lawn uh so that's definitely a good option um, there's an app that you can get that helps you um, connect with other people. It's called, I think it's called Share Waste, and it helps you connect with people so you can drop off compost, pick up soil, um, and that way you don't actually have to have it on your yard. Um, the other things we want to talk about are keeping any sort of food resources for your animals indoors. That's going to prevent all kinds of wildlife from being on your property. Um, using sprinklers or hoses that are motion sensing are extremely effective. Um, peafowl do not really love the water. They definitely don't like getting squirt with water. So um, if you're out there and you see peacocks, um, feel free to just give them a little squirt with your hose. It's not going to hurt them and it's going to remind them to not be so comfortable around you and your property. Um, and then there's also, like I said, the motion sensing sprinklers that are really effective. So you just want to make sure that you only turn them on um, when there aren't people, you know, running through your yard. So that way you don't squirt people, you're just squirting the animals. Um, and then landscaping your yard with plants that peafowl don't like. And we're going to share a list of those here. So feel free to Lauren, take a screen. I'm gonna yeah. throw, Lauren, I'm going to throw a poll question up first. 
Great. About oh. what, what does the, what does the audience think um, are some plants that peafowl do not enjoy? Okay, so I, I, I went back so that you can't see it. So <laughs> take a guess. Yeah, so the poll is up on your screen. We've got azalea and cactus, birds of paradise, hibiscus and jade, camellia and marigolds. And we're going to leave the poll up just for a couple more seconds. Hopefully we get a few more answers in those last five seconds or so. Right, and I'm going to close the poll now. So Lauren, um, what we've got on the list that PFL do not enjoy are azalea and cactus, birds of paradise, camellia, and marigold. And those are all correct. So great job, everyone. <laughs> um, so yeah, um, all of these plants that are listed here are gonna help to deter um, those peafowl from your yard. Um, so like I was saying before, if you wanna take just like a screen grab of this, um, there's also great um, spread uh, I think it's a downloadable PDF that we have um, in the handout section. You guys can click on that and download it and it has all of these listed. And also I believe the city of Arcadia has a has a whole page dedicated to this on their website as well. Um, so if you It's also to... on our website, Lauren. Oh, great. Our website too. So it's a lot of different places. <laughs> So that's pretty much what we have for PFAL. Do we have any other poll questions for PFAL before I move on, Michelle? No, uh, we don't, but I wanted to see if there, let's give it a moment to see if there's any questions from our audience about PFAL. Okay. So, you know, like I had mentioned at the top of the presentation, I lived in Arcadia for a very long time and, um, I would actually see, you know, see them early in the morning, walking themselves around, and just in in the neighborhoods and perching up on people's roofs. So, is it mm -hmm. a myth that peafowl can fly? They can fly, but like I said before, they're kind of like chickens. Um, they're related to chickens and and other land fowl, so they don't fly super long distances um, and they tend to like to perch on like lower branches of trees and on people's roofs and things. Um, so they can fly, just not, you know, they're not gonna be migrating across the country or anything like that anytime soon. All right, um, and then Lauren, what would you suggest if a peafowl were hit by a car? Like what, um, was, what would someone do in that case? Definitely text or call our wildlife helpline, that number at the very beginning that I gave you guys. Um, so anytime you have injured, sick, orphaned wildlife, um, give us a call. And um, if it's been hit by a car and if it's in one of our service cities, then we'll um, we'll likely send out an officer to come pick it up and, and bring it back to us and we can um, make an assessment, have our vets look at it and see if it's um, something that we can try and try and save and put back out. Um, but you know, a lot of times if people are hit by cars, it's, um, they're in pretty bad shape. So we just, um, a lot of times we'll just humanely euthanize um, so that way they're not suffering, but great question. All right, thanks. And I've put both um, the Wild High Life Helpline and the hours in the chat box, as well as the number for our dispatch. If you're trying to call us in regards to, you know, accidentally hitting a peacock while driving um, outside of the wildlife windows. Right. Yeah. For for that scenario, um, you can call dispatch, um, but Anything that's like uh, um, not, you know, super urgent, you could still text the helpline after hours even. You'll just have to wait until the next day because 
dispatch generally isn't going to be making decisions about admission for wildlife unless it's like very obviously something that's injured such as you know like being hit by a car so thanks for that michelle and any other questions before we move on um yeah so all of the flowers or the plants that are on that list is it a 100 percent deterrent or is it um just a likely deterrent and there's a, a a small percentage of pfl that may you know try and consume those plants yeah so nothing's going to be a hundred percent um and because every animal every individual animal is going to be a little bit different um so the only 100% way of making sure people don't get into your yard is if you have a really secure perimeter, um, basically like a dome around your house. But I don't think anybody's doing that in this area. <laughs> so, so we need um, to this, live in a bubble. Yeah, so, <laughs> so these are just these are just gonna be um, things that are gonna help deter, but yeah, it's not, it's, n it's never gonna be 100%, um, but it's it's like all wildlife, their instincts are basically making, and we're gonna talk a little bit about this when we get to coyotes too, it's always sort of a cost benefit analysis that's going through their head. Like, is it worth it for me to come and try and get food out of this person's yard? Um, are the costs greater than the benefits or are the benefits greater than the cost? And so they're kind of just weighing their options at all times. So if your yard is just full of these plants that they're not interested in, they're probably gonna move on somewhere else where there are food resources. So that's the thing. It's not like they see a marigold and they're like, oh no, I'm scared, I'm gonna run away. That's not kind of how it works. It's more just like these plants don't provide um don't provide the food resources that um PFL generally are attracted to and they might even have some um deterrent qualities as far as like you know they don't taste good or smell good or um things like that oh all right well thank you so much and let's go ahead and talk about those coyotes great okay time to shift gears so we're gonna do a pop quiz right now. Michelle's gonna throw up another poll. I wanna know what you guys think. How big are coyotes when fully grown? And if you've ever talked to me on the phone or emailed me <laughs> or um, been to one of my webinars before, hopefully you already know the answer to this, um, but your, your question or your options are 10 to 25 pounds, 20 to 35 pounds, 30 to 45 pounds, or 40 to 55 pounds. What's that looking like, Michelle? Uh, so it looks like we have a split vote right now between 20 to 35 pounds and 30 to 45 pounds. So I'm gonna that close the poll right. in like three seconds. All right, so how big is a coyote? Coyote is about 20 to 35 pounds, so kind of like a beagle. Um, they're definitely, you know, more stretched out than a beagle. <laughs> they, um, they're, they're lankier, they're leaner, um, but as far as like body mass, they're, they're pretty similar. So um, I know a lot of people do tend to think that coyotes are really big. They associate them with wolves um and you know wolves do get you know really big but coyotes they're they're quite small every coyote that i've ever gotten in at the shelter has been just you know like around 20 pounds and um it always kind of surprises me how small they are when they come in because even me someone who works with with wildlife all the time um i'm not immune to sort of the societal um uh picture that has been painted of coyotes right um as something that's like a menacing sort of uh big scary predator uh so i get it um but i hope that does ease a little bit of fears when you think about coyotes you can think about just um a small dog <laughs> um so we're gonna move on to talk about what is 
bringing the coyotes into our neighborhoods. So like I talked about before, right? The coyotes aren't coming down from the mountains. They, they live and are born in our neighborhoods, but the reason that they're thriving in our neighborhoods is because of these resources. So here we just have a couple of examples of, of what's bringing them in. And, and I think, uh, Michelle, did you have another poll about um, what coyotes yes. eat? Yes, I do. Sorry so this is a true, true or false. Uh, urban coyotes are carnivores. Oh, and if you're looking at the screen, you might've got a clue. <laughs> yeah, well, I will say, Lauren, it, it is um, almost, a, it is a split vote. Okay. But a majority um, says that it is a true answer. Mm. Okay. So what, what is our, you know, true answer? The true answer is that they are omnivores. They're opportunistic. So that's false. They are not, they are not strictly carnivores. As you can see here on this slide, there's fruits, there's bird seed, there's cat food. Um, and you know, cats are strictly carnivores. So, um, so that cat food is, is carnivore based, but coyotes will get whatever pet food is left out. Um, and, and they have good senses of smells. They are like our dog's genius cousins, um, super well adapted and super, um, just super smart. So they're, they're gonna eat fruit that's fallen off trees. They're gonna eat that seed out of your bird feeder. They'll eat pretty much whatever is available. So, we have this graphic here to talk about um, coyote reproduction and um, sort of the, the way that it works that coyotes reproduce. Um, and so they, they do reproduce in accordance with the amount of resources. So if there are a lot of resources in an environment, then the coyotes are gonna have more pups. And if there's less resources in an environment, then they won't have as many. Um, they might not have any if there's not many resources. Um, and that is true for many different um, uh, species that have uh, litters. So, um, so a lot of wildlife sort of follow this formula. But uh, Michelle, why don't you throw up that other poll about, um, about yeah. coyote removal? So there it is up. Uh, removing a coyote from a pack can help the population in the long run. So this question is about, you know, do you think that if, say, the city or Fish and Wildlife or someone were to come in and trap and take out a coyote, that that'll help lower the population of coyotes? in the long term. Oh, and I will say this is, uh, Lauren, overwhelmingly, the community feels this is a false statement. Wow, love that. Okay, you guys are smart. Um, and maybe it's also because I was just giving you hints about this, but... Um, <laughs> But basically, like I like I was saying before, you know, it really is about resources. So um, we have a link to a caring capacity video. If you guys want to watch that on your own time, um, it doesn't. We used to have it in the presentation, but it doesn't um, always work well um, when trying to share it. So um, I definitely encourage you to watch it. If you don't know about caring capacity, it's a really simple concept that's basically an environment or a habitat um, can only um, can only hold a certain number of any given population or any given species um, due to a couple of different limiting factors um, such as food space um, and you know there's a there's also limiting factors such as like disease and other predators so um, so basically what we're gonna talk about here is, is food resources and how that limits um, coyote populations in neighborhoods. So this is just a model. Um, let's say we have 
Um, each cat food bowl represents, you know, some certain amount of resources that will sustain one coyote and two of her pups. So let's say, you know, someone, um, you know, goes out and is like, we're going to, we need to get rid of these coyotes. There's too many of them. So they remove one coyote. So that also in turn will remove any pups that she might have, um, which is like, okay, cool, great. Now we have three less coyotes than we had before. But if you notice, those resources are still there. The, the, the um, you know, the cat food is still out. The bird feeders are still out. The fallen fruit is still littering um, the streets and the sidewalks and the backyards. And people are still letting all their little dogs off leash and the cats are roaming the neighborhood. So all these resources are still there. So what ends up happening is that the two remaining coyotes now are given access to more resources. They don't have to compete with that third coyote for them. And therefore they get, they end up having more pups. Um, and so what happens when we address the resources, eliminate those resources and not the coyotes. So in this model, we take out resources. Um, so maybe the neighborhood has gotten together and they're like, all right, we're gonna get, um, we're gonna all invest in wildlife proof trash cans. We're gonna take down all of our bird feeders. Um, and we're just going to like plant native plants instead to attract birds. Um, and we're going to make sure that um, all of our all of our dogs are on leash. We're not letting any pets go unattended. We're bringing in all of our cat food. We're not feeding the ferals anymore, um, et cetera, et cetera. And thereby effectively reducing the, the number of resources that can sustain um, this population of coyotes. Um, so what happens is now the amount of resources that are available can only sustain two coyotes rather than three coyotes and they are not getting passed on to those two coyotes. There's, there's no vacuum effect that's happening here that's going to draw in more animals to consume those resources um, and therefore it affects limits the number of coyotes in that population. Um, so I know it was kind of a long-winded way of explaining all of that, but I hope that makes sense. And please write down any questions that you have about that, and I can hopefully clarify anything at the end of this. Um, we are going to move on to humane exclusion. Um, so active and passive hazing are two really effective ways. In addition to removing resources, it's really important that we um, we establish ourselves, our, our human selves as, you know, top of the food chain. And um, because humans have eradicated, um, you know, brown bears and wolves from California, there really aren't any other predators that are keeping uh, the coyote species and even the black bear species um, sort of in check. Um, so that's why they, oh, that's one of the reasons why they're starting to feel very comfortable in the human environment because humans are afraid of them. <laughs> and so, um, so what hazing does is it makes it, passive hazing makes it uncomfortable um, for the animals to be on any given property. Um, and then the passive hate or the active hazing is when you see a coyote in your path, you're out on a walk or, you know, it's in your yard or something like that. You actively going out and, um, and, you know, shaking cans, shaking your keys, um, making lots of noise and effectively scaring it off. Um, as you can see here, this is why I was talking about the bird feeders earlier. Bird feeders feed more than just birds. And so passive hazing is also removing resources. That is considered part of passive hazing. So um, let's give active hazing a try. Um, these are all... Ask a poll. Oh yeah, okay, go. <laughs> 
Uh, what is a common hazing item? A whistle, keys, umbrella, a flashlight, or don't haze, just run away. <laughs> I hope that everyone knows which one not. Yeah, and I do like, you know, Lauren, when we address coyotes with um, our kids at, you know, one of our many different kids camps and activities. Uh, I love illustrating, you know, this to them. Yeah. So, all right. Um, I'm going to go ahead and close the poll. So in order of popularity, Lauren, it is keys, whistle, umbrella, and flashlight. Okay, keys, whistle, umbrella, flashlight. All right, yeah, so those are all great options for hazing. Um, though I just pulled out my keys right now and that's the sound it makes if you shake them. And I also have a whistle that I got from one of my first coyote presentations ever four years ago from Arcadia. I have a whistle on my um, on my keys. So I also have a um, a blinking light on my keys. Um, so there's all different sort of things that are really easy that you can just put on your keys um, that will be um, sort of novel or different but um, at the same time a lot of our neighborhoods and i'm sure a lot of you that are on this um on this uh call right now are are thinking you know i tried that i've tried keys i've tried um banging pots and pans i've tried the cans shake the shaker can with pennies and you know they just look at me and they don't move um and you know that's that's actually pretty normal for coyotes. That's normal coyote behavior. Um, like I said before, it's, they're they're like geniuses, right? And so they're really curious. And so they see you and they see you kind of acting silly and weird by making weird noises and raising your hands and things like that. And, and they're just kind of watching to see what happens a lot of the time, especially if it's something that they've heard or seen before. Um, so it's really important that we always are elevating our hazing and we're always hazing until the animal leaves the area. So if you just shake your keys once and they don't move, they just look at you, then you give up and go inside. That's just going to reinforce this idea that like the coyotes aren't afraid of us because there's nothing to be afraid of. So what needs so to happen? Lauren, can I you ask you a quick question? Yeah. Um, should you haze if you have pets or kids with you? Oh yeah, absolutely, a hundred percent. You should use your. You should bring them in close to you. Obviously, if you can pick up your kid and your pet, that's even better because it makes you kind of look like a monster. Um, and um, and definitely always you know i always tell people like teach your kids how to haze coyotes at a very young age um so it's coyotes aren't looking at humans even small humans as food resources they're just looking at us as um something that, that's associated with food resources so like i was talking about that cost benefit analysis earlier coyotes definitely are doing that every time they see us they're like mm, is that is that person scary enough for me to like forego whatever food I think they might have or they might, you know, leave behind? Um, Cause if they're not scary enough, then I'm just gonna wait here and watch and not go away because they're not that scary. Um, and so, so you really need to make it like not worth their while um, by being, Scary. And so these are just some other ideas. Um, I love the hose. Um, you could, like like with the pea fowl, you can use the hose with with coyotes as well, squirting them, um, filling a can with pennies or marbles, um, and shaking that is is pretty effective. But again, if you just do it once and then they don't move and then you give up and go inside, that's 
the going to have the opposite effect. So you really need to do it until they leave. And if they, if you're doing it and doing it and doing it and they're not moving, take a step forward and, and, you know, show them that you mean business. And um, as long as you're not cornering them, it's not going to provoke, people are always worried it's going to provoke um like if you show any sort of aggression it's going to provoke the coyote to like fight you back but let's remember that these coyotes are usually less than 35 pounds they're not interested in fighting us they're just interested in waiting it out until we get bored and leave or we give up and then they can you know come through and and see if we dropped any food or if we left our cat outside and um things like that uh, the umbrella is also a really good one. You can carry that with you on a walk and um, open and close it. And it kind of makes you look like a monster. Um, shining a flashlight in their face is good. Um, always like hold eye contact with the coyote and just be really aggressive, um, you know, and, and yell at it and, um, and just do kind of whatever whatever, you know, whatever empowers you to, to feel like, you know, I, I'm the top of the food chain, I'm the predator species here. Um, so um, that could be even, even if you have your keys, and you're shaking your keys, and you're shaking your keys, and it's not working, throw your keys at them, you know, pick up some sticks or rocks, throw it at them. And that's going to be um, uh, much more effective, especially to the ones that are used that are still that you know they've already heard all of this before and so they're like over it right <laughs> um so let's talk about our pet safety for a, for a second here too you know how do we keep our pets safe number one thing is going to be a leash we do not do not encourage the use of retractable leashes um for a number of reasons but one of the main reasons is you know your dog can go turn around a corner and who knows what's around that corner. It could be another aggressive dog. It could be a coyote. Um, it could be a number of things, but you wanna keep that, you wanna keep your dog on a six foot or shorter leash. Um, if all you have right now is a retractable leash, just keep it locked at that six foot um, stretch. Um, and so coyotes, you know, they know if you're, they, they can recognize these retractable leashes and they know, that if they're if your dog is far enough away from you, they're they're making those analysis in their head. They're like, hmm, do I think that it's far enough away that I can grab it and run and it'll break off the leash? And the and is it far enough away that the person isn't gonna come after me? Or, you know, and we've all heard the horror stories of people's pets being taken off leash. And a lot of times it's because these leash they're on like longer retractable leashes. Um, what else can you do? Supervise your pets. Um, if you have a small pet and you know that there's coyotes in your neighborhood, um, do not leave it outside unattended. Uh, I know it's, it's kind of a pain. You, when you just want to leave the back door open, let your dog come in and out, but, um, we don't want to take any risks. You know, um, you can get coyote rollers, which are really effective to put around your perimeter. So having a secure perimeter, is going to be the number one thing so go around make sure your fences are all you know are all fixed and um you don't have any holes that coyotes can get through six foot seven foot's even better um tall fences uh you know and coyotes can can use low tree branches and bushes and stuff to jump over these fences as well so you just want to make sure that there's nothing that's nothing up against your your perimeter walls and fences that they can use to climb over. But if you get coyote rollers and put them on the top, that's gonna help both with dogs that like to jump over fences, that'll keep them in. And then it'll keep coyotes that wanna jump into your yard out cause it just kind of rolls them back. They can't get that grip on the top. Um, catios for cats. If you have one of those cats that just meows, 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 drives you crazy until you let it outside. Um, there's a couple of things uh, you can do. You can call our behavior helpline and talk to them about how to provide more enrichment to your cat indoors because really the reason that they want to go outdoors is because they're bored. Um, so finding out ways to keep your cat occupied inside and stimulated 
um, will be really helpful. Or you can, um, if you have the resources and you have the space to build a catio, um, there's some really cool ones out there. Um, I know Michelle has her, has her cat leash trained, so her cat goes on a harness when it goes outside, um, and that's a really good option as well. And then getting dog runs that are enclosed and um, predator proof are going to be really um, a good option too. Um, it's kind of like, you know, if you had chickens, you want to make sure you have a secure chicken coop because you know that raccoons and foxes and coyotes um, see those as prey. So we want to have sort of the same mentality when it comes to the, our other pets like dogs and cats. Um, we want to make sure we keep them safe. Um, and then again, being assertive on your walks, carrying those different hazing devices, not leaving out pet food or other, you know, yummy items. If you had like a Kong toy that had a bunch of peanut butters, treats in it, we don't want to leave those outside either. Um, and then also spaying and neutering your pets and keeping them up to date on their shots are really um, going to be really important too, because your dogs are related to coyotes. So if you if you have a female dog that's going into heat, it could potentially attract coyotes. Um, and then same thing if your dog is is not neutered and there's coyotes around that are in heat, um, it could cause your dog to want to escape. Um, so really important to keep your pet spayed and neutered. And then um, let's talk about, um, these, I have a couple of pictures of different properties, um, and we're going to talk about the different things that we can do to change those properties to make them less attractive to coyotes. So here we have, um, you know, a catio, like I was talking about earlier. This is motion sensing sprinkler. This is going to represent trimming back hedges, um, keeping keeping your yard looking relatively manicured so there's not a whole lot of hiding spots for them um, is going to be really important too. Um, using vinegar or ammonia, dirty socks, those are all going to be smell deterrents. This is the coyote roller here on the side um, that goes on top of your fence. And then um, a radio, which can be effective in um, keeping animals out from different crawl spaces. Uh, so let's look at this one. This one's pretty obvious. Um, what we did here is we um, looked at this. Um, this person just basically had someone come over and, and clean up um, the overgrowth. So these are all good spots for, for wildlife to hide, including coyotes, obviously. So, um, so even trimming these up off the ground a little bit more would be um, would be helpful in preventing animals from taking up residence there. So, and uh, this one, we have this adorable little dog, but what is it? It's off leash, right? So put a leash on that guy. This one looks really nice. It looks well taken care of, um, but we do have this water source here. So especially in our um, Southern California, well, all the West Coast really right now, um, water is a really valuable resource. And a lot of people are like, well, you should leave water out for wildlife, you know, that are escaping from the fires and things like that. Um, we don't actually recommend that uh, because we don't want the unintended consequence of wildlife becoming um, dependent on humans for these resources and then feeling more comfortable in human dominated spaces. So um, if this, for, the, for this example, um, I would just recommend making sure that there is a secure perimeter around here if you do want to have um, stuff like a little fountain and things, um, because otherwise that's going to bring in a lot of wildlife. Uh, here we have a bear that has found the bird feeder. So I, just another example of, of um, why we don't love bird feeders. Um, not to mention that usually the seeds that people put in bird feeders are just basically junk food and there are a lot of seeds of non-native plants. Um, so what happens when a bird eats all these seeds? They eventually poop it out, right? And they might 
scoop it out out in some protected wildlife reserve national park area and then all of a sudden there's some invasive species that's growing there. That's an extreme example, but just, you know, one of those things that we think that we don't tend to think about when we think about the um, providing bird seed and things. Um, so the best thing to do really, if you wanna have um, lots of beautiful native birds coming to your yard is to plant lots of beautiful native plants that are um, pollinator plants um, and, if you have more questions about that, please email me and I can give you a great, some great resources. Um, and then here we have a, a crawl space, right? Uh, that some animal has broken into. So what do we do if an animal is um, denning underneath our house? Um, so we can use the radio. I would say, you know, if we have like a an iHome or one of those like smart speakers, you can put it in a plastic baggie so that it doesn't get all dirty and gross and just stick it under there and, and play, you know, talk radio or loud music or um, something that, that would be uh, kind of annoying to whatever animals living under there, make it sound like there's people around all the time. They're looking for a dark, quiet, comfortable space. So if we can make it nice and bright by using these, there's motion sensing lights, but you also could just grab a shop light and just put that under there and make it really bright. Um, and that's gonna be pretty effective. Um, using those smell deterrents like vinegar or old dirty socks, throwing those under there. Um, the vinegar or the ammonia, you can um, put like a rag halfway in, halfway out of um, like an old coffee can or something. And it's kind of like a candle wick. So it starts, um, the smell will sort of slowly fill the space that way. Um, but yeah, and then also I'd say about this, you can put, um, you could put like baby powder or flour sort of in like a semicircle around the entrance here. And that way you can see the footprints and know that the animal has left. Um, and then either hire someone to fix that up nice and secure, or if you're, if you're savvy to do that yourself, just make sure you get a really strong secure um, cover for that. This next one, beautiful yard, love it but these are all the things I would change. <laughs> Put a coyote roller on that back fence, um, remove the bird feeder. Um, if that's your pet bunny, I would not leave it out. If it's a wild bunny, obviously there's nothing really you can do about that. Um, and um, then there's another, I think a bird feeder over here, some water resources here. And then um, with all these hedges and things, just trimming them six inches to a foot off the ground will reduce a, a lot of the um, potential hiding spaces that coyotes like to, to be in. This one, obviously we wanna take our cat and not let it be outside on its own. Um, so getting things like a catio, um, that they can really enjoy the outside, play with bugs and things, but it also pr protects a lot of the native species like lizards and, um, and fledging songbirds um, from, uh, or fledging native birds from, from our, you know, killer cats. Um, so it's really good both ways. Um, and it's really important that we, we try not to let our cats just roam freely outdoors. Um, hey, hey then, Lauren, we've got about five more minutes and we've got a, a, quite a few questions coming in about coyotes. So do you think we could um, address those questions? Yeah, yeah. I think those are last one anyway. Um, okay. So let me just go through these last few couple uh, slides real quick. Um, so just some reminders, remember to haze every time you see a coyote that's in your neighborhood. If you're out on a hike or something and it's, you know, in, an, in a non-human dominated area, there's no need to haze them, especially if it's like up on a hill or something far away from you. Um, remember that hazing does take time and patience. Um, just like dogs, it needs to be consistent. Um, and humane exclusion is community effort. So you need to make sure you're talking to your neighbors about this stuff too. Even if you're doing everything right, if your neighbor is still feeding the feral cats and still 
you know, having all these great hiding spots and things for the coyotes, then it's not going to make a difference what you do. Um, and then the last little tidbits here, um, if humans are in immediate physical danger, if there's an immediate emergency, always call 911. Um, there's our wildlife helpline number again, that's 626-344-1129. Put that on your phone. Wildlife at PasadenaHumane.org is the um, best email address if you have questions about wildlife, including coyotes. I will respond to you within usually a couple of days. Um, and then if you live in any of these cities, the um, San Gabriel Valley Council of Governments has really, really good resources. They have a coyote uh, program um, that I've worked with closely on a lot of different things. Um, so you can go to that website there and then also you can report sightings to Coyote Casher and that's through the UC system. Um, it's uh, a reporting system that um, we, we like to also contribute to and use um, when we're trying to track where we're finding a lot of coyotes. Um, okay, questions. Let's do it. What do you got? Hit me. All right. If someone were to find um, a an animal in a coyote's mouth, what should they do? Um, well, if it's just a wild animal or not your pet, I would say leave it because that's just how life works. Um, the coyotes do need to eat and so that's what they're eating. If it is your pet, um, obviously, you know, you can fight off a coyote. They're 35 pounds, so you can chase it. A lot of times they'll just drop it. If you get close to the coyote, I've heard a lot of stories of people, you know, who have their pets grabbed by a coyote. They go chasing after it. The coyote drops it and runs off. Um, so are coyotes known to like bait dogs back to the path? Oh, what? Are they, are coyotes known to bait dogs back to the pack? bait dogs um yeah so or like lure them tempt them right. to you know i i don't think that's unheard of but it's not um it's also not um it's not that common especially with these urban coyotes they they just um they're really going for whatever's easiest so you know having an organized attack uh sort of hunting thing is is going to take a lot more effort than them just like trying to go scavenge some like roadkill or um you know a squirrel or something so it's less okay. likely to so what are your feelings on a coyote vest or an anti-coyote vest for pets i think that's great um you know i know that they put um spiky collars on a lot of the like shepherd dogs that take care of um flocks of sheep and things and and they're effective against wolves um so I, it's a similar concept with those spiky vests and stuff that little dogs have um so i don't know if if you want to like i said nothing's going to be a hundred percent um I'm not going right. to make any guarantees that it's going to a hundred percent protect your pet but um, better than better than nothing if you're leaving your pet outside unattended definitely better than nothing yeah um and then last question switching gears back to peafowl where do they nest i know you said they perch on like low branches and i've seen them on roofs but like where do they mm -hmm. sleep at night with the mamas and the babies yeah yeah the they'll sleep in those low branches and on roofs and stuff um i believe they're ground nesters but I would, don't quote me on that. <laughs> but the little, the babies, they, when they're born, they're, they're what's called precocious animals. So uh, mm. the babies are born and they're up and walking and eating on their own. Um, like a lot of the, like a lot of the ground uh, land fowl, fowl species. Um, so they're usually on the ground um, with their babies. Um, the nests are you know, often in bushes. I get calls from people all the time with little nests and bushes out in front of their house. And if you don't want those baby peafowl, you can just take those nests out and throw the eggs away. And that's totally perfectly fine and considered humane. Um, it's, 
you know, it's not, it's not hurting the, the, um, any potential babies in the eggs. Um, and, uh, and so that'll just prevent, you know, they're, they're not native species. So that's part of the thing. It's like, they don't really have any legal protections in that way. Um, so, so I, I mean, I think that that's perfectly fine. If people don't want a nest, they're more than allowed to move it or to just throw them away. So, all right. Well, thank you so much, Lauren, for sharing all of this information with us. Um, you know, one of my recommendations that Lauren mentioned is I've got my cat trained on a leash and he likes to go for walks, but we always keep him close to us but for that reason um when we go out uh i do want to say thank you to the community for joining us if you have any other questions you can email them to wildlife at pasadenahumane.org and when the video goes out tomorrow we'll also include the phone number for the wildlife helpline great so. thanks for coming everyone all right bye bye